Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. Let's pray. Father God, this is the story of your creation of us, of your plan for us. And Lord, we confess that we have fallen so far from this ideal that you gave us. We confess that we have made our marriages more a reflection of our culture than a reflection of you. Lord, I humbly ask that you would forgive us. Show us today your beautiful institution of marriage as it was supposed to be and help us stand up to the enemy and begin to reflect your love for us in our love for each other. Lord, speak to us today. Reveal yourself to us. Show us your way, which is always the best way. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Our scripture today comes from Genesis chapter 2. In the very next verse of scripture, the events that lead to the fall of man begin to unfold. But in this passage, the world is still perfect. Relationships are untarnished and humanity lives in perfect union with God. It is in this context of rightness and righteousness that God creates marriage. But as you can see from the stats, along with the fall of man, the institution of marriage also fell. We're going to spend the next three weeks looking at what God designed marriage to be, how it is supposed to function, and how we as a fallen people best live out the biblical picture of marriage. I realize that not all of us come from the same place. There are as many different perspectives on marriage here as there are people. Not all of you are married, whether it's your age or life circumstances. For many of you, maybe you long to be married, but that just hasn't happened yet. Others of you may have been married at one time, but it didn't last. And, and the wounds from that are still so painful that you have no desire to ever put yourself at that kind of risk again. Still others of you may have had a wonderful marriage, but your spouse passed, and you are left grieving and adjusting to a new reality. If that is you, and the church has for any reason ever made you feel less because of your singleness, I am truly sorry. You are not defined by your marital status. Singleness is not your identity. That's not who you are. You are a beloved child of God. 
living the life that God has for you right now. And I pray that you will stick with us in the next three weeks. Lean in and listen to what God has to say. Maybe someday you will be married and what you learn here today will be helpful. Maybe you have children or family members or friends who will one day get married and you having a biblical understanding of marriage will have a profound impact on them. And truth be told, the things that we talk about today the, um, the humility that we're called to display, the way we are to think about others, the commitment to prayer we should have, and, and communication strategies we'll learn are beneficial to everybody, what, whatever your stage of life. And to those of you who are raising children on your own right now, and those statistics that we saw filled you with despair, let me just say, that when the ideal falls short, grace abounds. When we are not able to live up to the ideal that God has set for us about the way a family should be or, or what it should look like, Jesus stands in that gap. You and your children have a father who loves you, who delights in you, and he is enough. He can right any wrong. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this. When the ideal falls short, grace abounds. Jesus will stand in the gap between God's ideal and our humanness. And for those of us who are married, we still have a lot of different perspectives. Some of you have great marriages, good, strong marriages, and others do not. If your marriage has been scarred by infidelity or abuse, verbal, emotional, physical, or sexual, either in your marriage or even prior to your marriage, it can be hard to find the kind of oneness that Scripture calls us to. If one of you is battling an addiction to pornography or to alcohol or to materialism, you may feel like it's not possible to make an honest connection. But please don't give up hope. Listen to what God has to say. Let's get started. As we read earlier, God lays out his ideal for marriage in Genesis chapter 2. While the world is still perfect and there's no shame, no fear, no sin, and although that ideal falls short, that ideal of becoming one in marriage falls in the very next chapter, that is still our goal. Throughout Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, oneness in marriage is the goal. In Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5, Jesus calls husbands and wives to oneness. Have you not read that the one who made them in the beginning made them male and female, and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together let no one separate. Though generally considered to be a passage about divorce, this is actually more about what marriage is supposed to be than what options are available to us when we miss the mark. The Apostle Paul calls husbands and wives to oneness in his letter to the Ephesians. Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Paul goes on to say, this is a great mystery, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. One flesh, oneness, is what biblical marriage looks like. This is marriage as God designed it. Not you and me living our individual lives but making some key decisions together like what house we should buy or how many kids we should have. But we, two lives becoming one life, 
one flesh. And this isn't just in the physical sense. One flesh means one spirit, one heart, one mind, one unit. One instead of two. Themes of oneness run all throughout Scripture. There's oneness in the Trinity. There's oneness between Christ and his church. There's oneness among the members of the church as we live out the body of Christ. And there's oneness in marriage. Today we're going to talk about oneness in marriage, why it's important, what it looks like, and how we get there. You've got um, this super cool pamphlet that has uh, notes on the inside, so if you want to follow along, the outline's kind of there, and you can fill in the blanks. Both Jesus and Paul pick up the quote from Genesis 2 at exactly the same place. They both start with, therefore. Some translations use the term for this reason or that's why. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Which begs the question, what reason? If there is a reason we are to do something, it's probably pretty important to understand that reason. The original Hebrew uses two words which literally translate to on account of and so. On account of the fact that woman came out of man. On account of the fact that we started as one because we are the same flesh and the same bone. Therefore, so now When we are united as husband and wife, we are to be one again as spouses. He created us as one from one. God in his infinite wisdom created us one from the other, woman from man. Now, you need to understand that this in no way indicates any type of male superiority over female. The idea of biblical oneness completely negates that as even a possibility. Oneness has no superiority. The first reason oneness is the goal in marriage is because we started as one. And while we started as one, the same bone, the same flesh, God clearly made us different. Yet both men and women bear the image of God. This is made clear in the first chapter of Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The Hebrew word for man in verses 26 and 27 refers to both men and women. It's a gender neutral term in Hebrew. It would probably be better translated mankind or humanity. God made all of mankind, both men and women, in his image. And we best reflect that image of God together when we work and live as one. God exists in relationship, and we, as people created in his image, best bear that image when we are in relationship. That's why it's so important in marriage that we become one flesh. Perhaps the most important reason for biblical oneness is that men and women together best bear the image of our Trinitarian God. It is in our oneness as a married couple, husband and wife, together, that we best reflect the image of God that we were created in. There is one more reason for oneness in marriage. Look again at verse 18 in Genesis 2. Up to this point in Scripture, everything God has spoken into existence has been either good or very good. Heavens and earth are good. The sea and land are good. Plants, good. Animals, good. Man, very good. But then, 
In verse 18, for the first time, something is not good. And sin doesn't enter into it. There is man, very good man, standing in the garden God created for him with good work to do. And God says, this is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. He needs something or someone to help him do the work I have given him to do. I'll give him a helper, an ezer in Hebrew. Men and women were created to work together, helping and completing each other and the work they were given to do. The final reason for oneness in marriage is because God gave us work that we can only accomplish together. So that's the why biblical oneness is important. But what does it look like? Adam and Eve were given a task bigger than themselves to accomplish. They were to work and keep the garden. When a couple truly becomes one, they recognize the higher calling that God has given them as a couple to accomplish. That calling will look different for every couple, but every couple does have a calling. Something bigger they were given to do than just their marriage. Biblical oneness looks like a husband and a wife passionately pursuing what God has called them to accomplish together. I know in this hyper-individualistic culture, All this talk of oneness doesn't feel right. I get it. I do. It's a violation of your own individual self. From a very young age in our culture, we're taught that our self is very important. But that idea of holding self up above all else is a very secular, very Western worldview. It is not a biblical worldview. And I know that's hard to hear. (laughs) I like things to be all about me. That's my sweet spot. I, I like that place where it's all about me. But I can't find support of that anywhere in Scripture. So I'm going to fill you in on a little secret. I don't stand up here today because my husband Eric and I have this all figured out. We don't. There are times in our 19 years of marriage that we have had great oneness. He is truly my best friend. And, and there have been times when we can read each other's minds. Right now he's thinking, I cannot believe she's talking about me in front of everybody else. There have also been times in our marriage that we've been so absorbed in our own individual lives and jobs and wants and desires and needs, whatever, that the other one was a roommate at best or an obstacle to overcome at worst. The number one problem in marriage, for sure in mine, but I am telling you also in yours, is self-centeredness. Our great Western philosophy of taking care of self, of nurturing self, of making self happy, is destroying our marriages. Marriage is not about your happiness. Just ask any of the couples here who've been married for 50 years or more. They're not happy. I'm totally kidding. They're happy. <laughs> but they didn't, they didn't get where they are by pursuing their own happiness. At some point in their marriage, at many points in their marriage, they had to put their own happiness aside and put the needs, wants, and desires of their spouse above themselves. Gary Thomas said it best in his book, Sacred Marriage, when he said, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? 
Our culture tells us that we should be happy in our marriage, that marriage is there to fulfill our needs and our desires. And the moment that your marriage stops doing that, stops making you happy, stops fulfilling your needs and desires, it is perfectly acceptable to end it. It's your right to find someone or something that can make you happy. You deserve it. But our culture is wrong. That's not what the scripture says marriage is supposed to be. And God invented marriage. I I think he knows what he's talking about. Not surprisingly, research supports scripture. A group of researchers followed 645 couples who reported being unhappy in their marriage. Five years later, those who had divorced were no happier than those who stayed together. Curiously, two-thirds of the couples who initially reported being unhappy in their marriage but stuck it out and stayed together reported being happy in marriage five years later. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is subjective. Happiness is not why God created marriage. However, when things are functioning in your marriage the way they're supposed to be, the way God laid it out, both husbands and wives find immense happiness. But that is the effect, not the goal. Marriage isn't about happiness, it's about oneness. And oneness looks like putting your spouse above yourself. In the Ephesians passage, Paul calls the unity of oneness a profound mystery. Because this union between a man and a wife is a reflection of Christ and his church. The Greek word Paul uses means great secret. The secret is that when God invented marriage in Genesis 2, he was already pointing to the saving work of Christ and the church. And Christ, and like Christ, we are to love our spouse in the same way that Christ loved his church. With great humility, putting our spouse's needs above our own. Paul paints a picture of exactly what this looks like in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one look not only to his own interests, but to the interest of others. He goes on to say that our attitude should be the same as Christ's who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Although These words were not written specifically for marriages. This is the type of humility that spouses, like all Christians, are called to. The type where one spouse would lay down their life for another. This is what oneness in marriage looks like. Humility. Selflessness. Putting your spouse above yourself. Genesis 2.24 gives us another example of what biblical oneness looks like. A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Most people don't think twice about this phrase. It fits our Western culture. It doesn't seem like all that hard of a concept to grasp. Children grow up and sometime in early adulthood we hope and pray they move out. But that wasn't the case for the ancient Israelite society. This idea of of leaving your father and your mother was scandalous. The joint family, the, the family that a married son and his wife would belong to, 
was the basic unit of Israelite society. It was the focus of religious, social, and economic influence. It was history, faith, and tradition. Each joint family had its own land inheritance. To leave this family unit was to leave everything. It meant leaving inheritance. It meant leaving your identity. It meant leaving stability and wealth and clinging or holding fast to your wife who had nothing in Israelite society. They didn't own land. They didn't have wealth. To cling to her, it was taking all the loyalty that belonged to the family of origin and giving it solely to the wife. Holding fast or clinging to her, leaving your father or your mother and holding fast to your wife means today that your spouse should be the most important relationship you have outside of your relationship with God. Your spouse is more important than your relationship with your parents, more important than your work, more important than your kids, more important than your own identity. Biblical oneness looks like putting your spouse above all other relationships. So how do we go about achieving this type of oneness in our broken and fallen state? Only through the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Let's be honest. No one is selfless. We are all selfish creatures, and marriage will shine a spotlight on that selfishness like a thousand-watt light bulb shining in your face. In great marriages, both people recognize their selfishness and choose to actively and consciously try to be selfless. We can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you try to do it in your own will and power, I guarantee that you will fail. It's only when you allow the Holy Spirit that's living inside of you to inform the way you act, to inform the words that you speak to your spouse, to inform the way you love your spouse, that you will be able to get over your own brokenness and be one. We achieve biblical oneness only through the power of the Holy Spirit. Biblically, love is not an emotion. It's a commitment. It isn't a feeling. It's a decision. 1 Corinthians 13 describes love using action words. It's patient and kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It doesn't insist on its own way. It isn't resentful. It rejoices in the truth. It bears hopes and endures all things. It's an action, not an emotion. We achieve biblical oneness when we act out the actions of love. When we are patient and kind to our spouse, despite how we feel, we are pursuing oneness. When we let go of our rudeness and our need for our own way and we demonstrate oneness, when we rejoice in the truth of who our spouse is in Christ, we pursue oneness. Some time ago, a friend of mine said something to me that was so simple, yet so profound. I was annoyed with Eric. I'm sure he'd done something horribly wrong. I couldn't tell you what that is, but it's probably his fault. Um, and, and she said to me, as, as I'm sharing with her, she said, are you viewing Eric as God wants you to see him or as Satan wants you to see him? You see, when Eric and I are in a disagreement, it's easy for me to think the worst of him to assume that he's trying to hurt me somehow, that he isn't for me, that he isn't on my side, that I'm not a priority in his life, or that he doesn't want what's best for me. My mind can spin out of control with all of these and perseverate on all of the bad characteristics that Eric has, some that aren't even true of him. 
But that's what Satan would have me think. Rejoicing in the truth means that I choose to see Eric as God sees him, even when we are disagreeing. To see him as a man who does love his wife who does want what's best for me. And even if we disagree on this particular point, he's on my side. He's for me. He wants what's best for me and my family. I am a priority. The next time that you are ticked at your spouse later this afternoon, (laughs) choose to see them as God would have you see them. And not as Satan is telling you they are. You will be one step closer to oneness, even in the midst of a disagreement. To many of us in this modern culture, marriage is a contract. You do your part, and I will do mine. The problem with this is that when one party violates the contract, the other party can simply opt out. I'm committed only to the point that you do what you told me you would do. But that isn't a biblical understanding of marriage. Marriage is a covenant, not a contract. A covenant is irrevocable regardless of the circumstances. The marriage covenant is intended to reflect the love and covenant that God has with his people. God covenants with us not because of what we have done or will do, not because what we give back to him, not because of some future thing that we're going to do, just because. And God's covenant cannot be broken. That is what a marriage covenant should be. A commitment to act lovingly to our spouse regardless of how they act toward us. A covenantal view of marriage is like thinking of your marriage as a room. There's lots of doors and windows, lots of ways out. Maybe one door is divorce. Maybe another door is an affair. Maybe a window is fantasizing about somebody else or or looking at pornography. Or maybe a window is just living together as roommates. Not as one, not happy, but not divorced. A covenantal marriage closes all of those doors and windows and, but, and bolts them shut. There is no way out. And then you commit to making that room, that marriage, the best that it can be. We achieve biblical oneness when we commit to marriage as a covenant, not a contract. This isn't easy. Nowhere in scripture does it say that marriage is easy. Ask those couples who've been married 50 years if it was easy, and they will tell you no. But it is worth it. I could go on and on, but I'm already over time. So I will leave you with this. The number one thing that you can do in your marriage to pursue oneness, we're going to talk about next week. (laughs) So you have to come back. It is the most intimate thing that you can do in marriage. Research shows that doing this regularly will increase your health, increase your joy, and strengthen your marriage. Now remember, the kids are in the audience next week, so it's not what you're thinking it is. (laughs) It's prayer. So come back next week and we'll talk about the power of prayer in your marriage. But real quick, if you are ready to pursue this type of oneness in your marriage and you don't know what your next step should be, on August 19th, we are launching a new program called Re-Engage, and it is a marriage enrichment uh, program. It will start August 19th, and it goes 18 weeks. It's, it's pretty intense, but it is so good. We piloted it this spring. It's from 5.30 to 7.30 here at the Quivira campus. Child care is provided. It's $50 per couple, but we have scholarships available. If you want to know about, more about Reengage, email me, and I would be happy to fill you in. If there is one thing that you could do for your marriage in the next four months, this is it. This is a game changer for your marriage. So we hope that you will join us. Stand now and receive your benediction. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this institution of marriage that you have given us. 
And Lord, we ask that the marriages in this room would reflect your love for us and their love for each other. Lord, we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we would begin to love as you love, that we would forgive as you forgive and think of our spouse as you think of them. Lord, bless all of the people who are here today, those who are married and those who are single. Let your words fall on them in this coming week. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen.